I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at SharpSpring, and welcome to another installment of the Agency Acceleration Series. Thank you for joining us today. You know, this series has been phenomenal. It kicked off for us on August 5th with Jay Bear. The next week we had Neil Patel, and uh, you know, I think we're on episode six now with Drew McClellan. Uh, last week we had, or it was two weeks ago now, I guess we had Shama Haider who spoke with our CEO, Rick Carlson. And you know, this kind of content, the reason we do the Agency Acceleration Series is because we've built our entire business around agencies. And even in a strong economic client, building a uh, climate rather, uh, building an agency is hard work, you know, and, and in this climate, it's even harder. And so that's why with SharpSpring, we've built our comprehensive sales and marketing automation platform specifically for agencies to help them market themselves better, to help uh, them market their clients better and create a new recurring revenue stream. So I'm super excited again to get to Drew's content today. And so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Drew because he's gonna be talking about how agencies can sell successfully in 2020 and beyond. And I know that we are streaming live to a lot of different platforms, including some of Drew's platforms. So welcome to all of Drew's followers, uh, or if you're joining us on one of those platforms. Um, so Drew owns and runs the Agency Man Management Institute, also known as AMI. And that's a consultancy for agencies that's really been helping owners grow since the early 90s. And you know, Drew is often interviewed and quoted in Entrepreneur Magazine, the New York Times, CNN, Business Week, et cetera. So he's kind of a heavy hitter. We're excited to have him today. And he's an, a five-time author as well, uh, including his most recent book, Sell with Authority, and you know, special for those of you that are attending today, if you're registered for this series, um, and by the way, if you're just joining us for the live stream, we're going to send, we're going to uh, share the link in the chat so you can go ahead and sign up for the rest of the series. And I'll, I'll talk more about who's coming up next shortly. But you can get a signed copy of Drew's book if you choose a uh, to have a demo uh, of the Sharp Spring platform. So we'd be super excited to to show it to you. And this book looks phenomenal. And again, just right on point for uh, Drew's session today and what we're gonna be chatting about. So we are going to um, do two things here today. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna play a, a video actually of Drew uh, sharing his philosophy on, on selling better and business development for agencies. And <clears throat> hopefully it, it, it works great for you. We had a little bit of latency earlier, so just Wait a few moments if it's if it's uh, taking a minute to pick up, and uh, I think the video will work out great. And then Drew's going to join me right afterwards for a live Q and A, and I'm super excited to get into it and uh, introduce you to Drew and get going. So with that, let's go to the video, and I'll see you in a few minutes. Thanks. Hi, I'm Drew McClellan from Agency Management Institute. And I am psyched to be with you today to talk about BizDev as part of the Agency Acceleration Series. Before we get into the conversation, I want to give a quick shout out and thank you to the folks at SharpSpring. Their ongoing commitment to small and mid-sized agencies is evidenced in this program and everything they do all year long. So a thank you to them for caring about our work and helping us do it better. If you are not familiar with me or Agency Management Institute, or as we often call it, AMI, AMI has been around since the late 90s, and our sole focus is helping agency owners run the business of their business better. We know that most agency owners are accidental business owners, and so they're great at the client-facing stuff, but all of the things, the back of the house things, uh, managing the people, managing the money, um, knowing the right agency specific financial metrics to running your business, biz dev, process, systems, all of that sort of stuff is not as natural to them. And our job is to help them make more money and keep more of the money they make by helping them build the backside of their business to be stronger and better. 
And so that's what we do. And so as you can imagine, one of the topics that we are often talking to agency owners about is business development. So I'm excited that that's the topic that we're going to talk about today. So let's jump right in. So for many agencies, most agencies start in this little gray box. So I love this chart because it sort of shows a couple things. One, it shows the progression that an agency can take, but it also shows you that you have choices as an agency owner. You can choose to stop in any one of these landing spaces that fits you and your vision for your business. Um, but, and most agencies, 85% or so, are in the gray, light blue, or dark blue landing spot. So let me walk you through these and how these relate to biz dev. In the gray circle, this is what most agencies look like when they started. So they hung up their shingle and they started doing work for family and friends and people that they knew. But sooner or later, they wanted to be bigger. They wanted to serve clients outside their personal network. And so they moved up into the light blue circle. And typically the way they got into the light blue circle is they got a referral. And they continue to grow their business through referrals. The problem with having one gorilla client, and a gorilla is an, a client that occupies 25% or more of your adjusted gross income, is they have a lot of influence over your agency. They have a lot of influence over the services you provide, the way you price, the way you deliver your services. And if that gorilla goes away, you're in a very vulnerable position. So many agencies aspire to move into the dark blue circle. And so now to do that, they have, to, they have to leap off of referrals. And by the way, it doesn't mean they stop getting referrals, but it means they have to add to the way that they get business. And so now what they do, uh, agencies in this uh, dark blue circle, they do what I call feast and famine biz dev. And this may sound familiar to you. So this is uh, when an agency billings are a little soft or you're getting a weird vibe from a client that they might be unhappy, you go into full court press mode and you are scrambling and doing everything you can to generate business development conversations. Everybody in the agency has a role in drumming up business. And you know what? Sooner or later it works. And now all of a sudden, as you've been doing this, you land a client or two. The problem is you were spending so much time on biz dev that the minute the clients walked in the door, the minute it was successful, you had to stop the biz dev efforts to actually onboard and take care of the clients. So you hadn't built a system and it wasn't sustainable. And so agencies go through this cycle, what I call feast and famine, where you do a ton of new business in the beginning, often uh, because you think you're gonna lose a client or in January when you've set a goal. And then throughout the year, it just sort of wanes. And then only when you're in crisis, do you gear it back up again. So 85% of agencies, they grow their business in some combination of these three things, family and friends, referrals, and feast and famine biz dev. But I want you to at least consider moving up into the green or gold circle. And so let me show you what that looks like. So the green and gold, the green is niches. So now what's happening is you are niching your agency. What I mean by that is you are defining, rather than working with every butcher, baker, and candlestick maker, you are defining who your ideal client is by specializing in some way. And typically an agency niches in one of three ways. They niche either by industry. So healthcare, by the way, is not a niche. It's an entire industry. But pharma products for women over 50 is a great niche. So they niche by industry or vertical, or they niche by audience. Uh, we can reach millennial moms better, faster, with more influence than anyone else. Or the third way is a methodology. So we have an agency in AMI that is specializes in working with challenger brands. So they seek out clients that are not the market leader and help that number two or number three or number four position product or service take market share from the market leader. So niche can be industry, vertical, it can be audience, or it can be methodology. And what that does is all of a sudden it simplifies everything for you in terms of the content you produce, in terms of your targeted new business list, in terms of the trade shows you go to. It makes everything easier because now your world and your focus has gotten much more narrow. And now you can talk about on your website and your content, how you, and your case studies, how you help this specific group of businesses achieve their business goals. 
Great. Another option for you is to move up into the gold circle. Less than 5% of all agencies occupy this space. And what this is, is it's taking being a niche agency and it's moving it to being an expert. And the difference between being a niche agency and being seen as an expert, or as I like to call it, an authority, is an authority has three elements to it. Number one, you have a niche. You've defined that. You've been very clear about it in all your communications. Number two, you have a strong point of view. And a strong point of view is how you approach the work, what you know is true about that niche that you serve. So for example, at AMI, our strong point of view is most agency owners are accidental business owners. So everything we do comes from that point of view. Every program we develop, every workshop, all of our peer groups start with that point of view. So strong niche, strong point of view. And the third one, and this is the critical, this is the critical one that moves you from just being a niche agency to being an authority or an expert. And that is that you teach. You frequently and generously teach what you know. And you can teach it by writing a book or by doing research or by speaking on stages, but you are always teaching from the point of view of how can I make the audience's job easier and better? In other words, how can I help my prospects long before they are my prospect? Okay, why does that matter? Well, it matters for a couple of reasons. Number one, CMOs are under incredible pressure right now. This was true prior to COVID, but boy, is it true now that they are coming out of COVID and trying to make up for sales. They've got to justify every decision they make and every penny they spend. So it is much easier for them to be able to sell an agency up through the ranks if that agency is a niche or an authority agency. When you're an expert and they can point to the fact that you've literally written the book or you've got a podcast series or you do research every year, it's a lot easier for them to justify and it feels a lot safer for them to make the choice of hiring you. Because remember, if they get that choice wrong, they lose their job. So there's a lot at risk. At AMI, we do primary research every year. We go out and we talk to business owners, CMOs, uh, VPs of marketing, anybody who hires agencies on a regular basis. And last year, prior to COVID, we were talking to agencies in our 2019 Agency Edge series. We were talking to them about how they decided what agency to work with. So one of the paths we went down was, did you find the agency you're working with now or did they find you? And you can see it by this graph. So the numbers on the bottom are their annual marketing budget. You can see by this graph, anywhere from 53% to 85% of the respondents, and there were over a thousand of them. So this is a statistically valid study. They went and they found their agency. Their agency did not find them. Later in the study, we said, how important is it to you that your agency be local? That you can like just hop in the car and go see them? Again, remember, pre-COVID. And what we found, again, by budget numbers, anywhere from 23% to 64% said, my current agency lives 200 miles or more away from me. So it doesn't matter to me that they are local. We find other ways to communicate. There are things that are more important to me than them being local. And we said, okay, so you went and found your agency. You chose an agency that lives more than 200 miles away from you. Why? Why did you make those choices? What they told us resoundingly is that they picked their out-of-market agency they went looking for, found an out-of-market agency, not because they were out of market, but because they had a depth of expertise in something they wanted. So if you look at this chart, you can see they cared about an agency that had experience in a particular geography. In other words, I wanna break into the upper Northwest, so I want an agency that really has a depth of expertise in that. I want an agency that has experience or expertise in an industry or a consumer, you know, 43%. I want an agency, and obviously they could answer more than one of these because it doesn't add up to 100. I want an agency that has expertise in a language. And when we drilled down into that question, it really tied into the consumer that they were trying to reach. And it was often, a Hisp for example, a Hispanic audience. Uh, we want an expert in a type of marketing. Look at how low that number is in comparison, 18%. 
Why? Well, because odds are there is someone local or near them that does any kind of marketing they want these days. So that wasn't as valuable to them for them to go out of market. And please notice that only 16% of them chose, went and found an agency and chose an agency that was more than 200 miles away because of price. This is not about price. And in fact, you can absolutely charge a premium if you're an authority agency, if you come from an authority position. So that to me is why having a niche is not enough. When you are an authority, when you can be findable as that, as, as that authority position, when you are at their largest trade show for their industry and you're standing on the stage speaking about a piece of research that you did, that allows you to cherry pick the clients you serve, to charge a premium price, and it completely changes the way you do biz dev. So there's a great study that comes out every year, the Edelman Trust Barometer. And uh, they came out with their 2019 results. So again, pre-COVID in January of 2020. And they were talking in this study about the power of influencers. And that really it was influencers. It wasn't celebrity influencers. It was people that looked just like me, right? So it was people who look like me, the respondent, those are the people whose ratings and reviews that I pay the most attention to because I think they are most, they have the most in common with me. But there was a very interesting part of the study that showed, and I want to read it to you. The one attribute that ranked higher than the trust we have in people like me is the trust we have in highly educated experts, company, industry, and academic experts. So as you can see in this quote from Richard Edelman, it's about earned influence, which is what authority positioning and marketing does for us as agencies. We earn the influence because it is clear that we are the subject matter experts. I believe in this so much, I literally wrote the book about it with my co-author, Stephen Wessner. So it's not about being findable anymore. It is about being sought after. So can you imagine how biz dev would be different for you if you were out teaching and sharing what you knew on a consistent and regular basis to a narrow audience and they started knocking on your door? In other words, you're on their radar screen long before they're on yours. This is the pivot of biz dev for 2020 and beyond. We have to be sought after, not just findable. People, people, clients, CMOs, directors of marketing, they are seeking out authorities and we can be that authority. And in fact, we can live in, in the beginning, the green circle and move our way up into the yellow circle. That I believe is why and how we should be selling today and how you can differentiate your agency from all of the other agencies out there because you are an authority in the niche that you serve. Again, industry, vertical, audience, or a methodology. And then when you stay narrow and focused on that and you generously teach from that platform over and over and over again, you are gonna be amazed at what it does for your biz dev efforts, your AGI, and your bottom line profitability. Okay, I know I just shoved a lot into 15 minutes, but now I am ready to answer your questions. That was a great session and welcome back everyone. If you're just joining us now, my name is Chip House. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at SharpSpring. Welcome to the Agency Acceleration Series. And I love that session and I'm super excited to welcome Drew. How are you doing today, Drew? I'm good, how are you doing? I'm doing great. It's a beautiful day here in Minneapolis. The leaves are starting to fall. It, Minneapolis in the fall is about as good as it gets. Uh, you know, we were ch chatting earlier as a team. It sounds like the Northeast, you know, with the mountains and things like that's pretty great too. So anyway, so I would love to get into this uh, today. It was a great session and I just want to know more. And I'm sure that the, the people out there want to know as well. Just talk to us more about your journey to being a business owner and the founder of the Agency Management Institute. Yeah, so I uh, started working for agencies uh, while I was still in college. My, um, when I was working on my undergrad, one of my adjunct professors uh, was at Gray Advertising in Minneapolis and offered me a freelancing job. 
And I just never looked back. I've always worked in agencies. So in 1995, I was, um, I was about 30. And <clears throat> as I often say, it was the perfect combination of arrogant and ignorant. How hard can it be to run an agency? I was working in an agency. I wasn't happy there. So I started my own agency uh, and we're 25 this year. So my agency is still going strong, knock on wood, and I still run it and I'm active in it every day. So very quickly, I learned how hard it actually was to run an agency. And I was one of those accidental business owners. And so I found an organization that was focused on teaching agency owners how to run their business. And that was the precursor to Agency Management Institute. So now fast forward to about 15 years ago, and um, the founder of that organization wanted to retire, and he came to me and he said, Drew, I think you're the guy to take this organization in a different direction and, and just blow it up, make it bigger and better. And long story short, we talked about it, and I bought him out. Uh, and at that point, it was just a couple peer groups and a workshop. And um, today, obviously, we've expanded our reach and our offerings quite a bit, um, but that organization changed the way I ran my agency. It allowed us to be profitable through all kinds of up times and down times. So I know from personal experience, I sound like one of those hair plug commercials, but <laughs> I I was a member, and um, yeah. I just want to reassure everyone: this is my hair. But um, but I I experienced it, and so I was excited to buy it and to grow it, and that's what I've spent the last decade or so doing. Got it. That's that's perfect. You know, so I think a lot of people would love to hear from somebody who has so much experience as you. And so you've been the agency business now 30 years ish, something yeah. like that. You and I are about the same same age, I think. Um, so is it easier today to sell or is it harder to sell now? What would you say? Oh, I think it's much harder. I mean, first of all, um, you know, it used to be back when I started in my career, no business other than huge brands could even name a single agency, let alone five or 10 or 20. And they had no way to find them because the internet wasn't around and we weren't all on it. And so selling was really about face-to-face -face sales. It was about networking. It was about building relationships. And now today, you know, as, as our data shows, all of the clients out there, all they have to do is hop online and they can their buying choices are infinite. And so we have to stand out in that marketplace in a way that we never had to do in, in the air quote, good old days. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a whole new world, right? Yeah. Right. For sure. So, um, you know, we, by the way, I don't think I mentioned this, but we are, we're live, we're taking chat questions. I'll definitely try to get to your chat questions as they're coming in from our producer here. Um, and so please do, chat in questions if you have them for Drew. So in the talk, Drew, you talked about many agencies getting stuck in feast or famine right. in the business development stage. Right. And, and you know that really rings true to me from the agency owners that I know. So can you summarize again the steps for an agency to break this habit and to move to a more sustainable uh, business development? Yeah, I think one of the core problems of the feast and famine sort of methodology, which is how many of us grew our agencies at one stage or another, is that it's not sustainable because it's frenetic in what you're doing. And your target, when I mean, you're casting such a wide net that you just can't possibly sustain communications with and build relationships with all of those people. And today, the other problem with that is if you create generic marketing content like Pantone announces its new color of the year, you and 20,000 other agencies wrote about that same topic. So nothing makes you look different or stand out from other agencies. So the way to step away from that is to begin to define how you're different. And you know what? It's, what amazes me is we do this for clients every single day, and yet it is painfully difficult to do this for ourselves. And I, I hope it actually makes us more empathetic with our clients when they struggle with it. But I think for us, it is difficult because we have this misperception that if I specialize or if I narrow my focus, I'm leaving bags of money on the table. All these other people who could hire me are not going to hire me because I am you know, the agency that works with clients who do pharma for women over 50 or whatever my niche is. 
And the reality is there's a big difference between your outbound sales and marketing efforts, how you position and brand yourself. And people will still come in the door because of referrals and networking and all those things. So you're really not turning away business. Although ultimately, when you really get to be a subject matter expert, you can and you should turn away business. If somebody doesn't fall into that sweet spot for you, now you have the luxury of choosing who you work with. But it all starts with recognizing that you can't be everything to everyone. And so, you know, when I, when I teach a workshop, I make everybody stand up and introduce themselves. And 90% of the agency owners will say, well, we're a full service integrated marketing agency. And at the end, I say, look around and meet your competition. You're all full service marketing. In space. Agents, yeah. Right? So you've yeah. got to differentiate yourself. That's how you step out of the feast and famine. And now you've got a very narrow target and you know how to create content and you know where to go to fish to find those particular fish. It just changes the game. No question. So it is interesting how so many agencies are sort of the, sort of the proverbial cobbler's kids, if you right. will, you know, right. how they, they themselves last in the process. But, you know, one of the things that you mentioned really resonated with me also, it was just kind of recasting yourself as an agency owner, as a teacher, you know, yeah. and so many of the agency owners and leaders that I know are great teachers. If I think right. about them that way, that's what they do every day. They present slides, they present cases and pitches, and they're, they're teaching their clients day in and day out. Right. Uh, so that's super interesting. And they do have a lot of the skills uh, and they can build on them even more, you know, so that one. Yeah, they, quote, just, they just don't think of themselves with that label, but you're right. They're natural teachers. They do, yeah, they don't think of themselves as with that label. Yeah. Um, it sort of related the quote from Richard Edelman really resonated. You know, right. it's again, it's not purchased influence, it's earned influence. And I think a lot of agencies aren't thinking this way. So how does an agency yeah. earn their influence as an expert? You know, um, first of all, before I answer that question, if somebody puts a question in the question box, if you guys will stick my email address, which is Drew at agencymanagementinstitute.com. If we don't answer your question during this session, if you will send it to me at my email, I promise I will email you an answer back. So I don't want anyone to go with their questions not answered. So how does an agency move to earning influence? Well, one of the things we've all experienced as agency owners or leaders is that it's much more difficult. The audiences out there are much more cynical about paid endorsements and things like that. And so their sniff test for BS is pretty strong. So the way we earn influence is by being helpful, as ridiculously simple as that sounds. And here's the key. A good teacher does not sell from the pulpit, wherever they're teaching. So whether it's their podcast or they've written a book or they've, they're sharing some research, they share, they teach frequently and generously, but without a sales pitch. And that's the hardest thing for agency owners. We are so wired to sell, but we have to think of the prospects that we're teaching. We have to think of our students as deer, that we would like to come in our yard and eat from our hand. And if we rush at the deer prematurely, they run back into the forest. But if we just keep earning their trust over and over and over again by being helpful, they keep coming closer and closer to us. And sooner or later, they will ask us for help. Yeah, you know, it, it's um, it's interesting um, how when you speak from an area of authority, you know, which is easier when you're leaning into a niche that's comfortable for you. Right. Uh, how you just, you're more credible, right, to everybody. So, you know, it, it kind of dawned on me a few weeks back in the Acceleration Series, we had David C. Baker and he was talking about how most agencies are not specific enough in their messaging, right? Um, which seems like a similar message, you know, to, to your book, Sell with Authority. Yeah. I'm, certainly some differences too. But so what steps can agency leaders do to find that right niche? And maybe you talked about it a little bit, but um, if you could build on some more, um, please do. Yeah. So I think David is right. I just don't think he goes far enough. So what he's talking about is if you think about that chart, 
he's talking about getting into the green circle, which is you have a niche. And I wholeheartedly agree with that. But I think there's an even more hallowed position that we can get when we are an authority. But in terms of determining our niche, honestly, we make it more complicated than it needs to be. If you look at the case studies you always show, if you look at the clients that you really love, if you look at the industries or again, the audience or the methodology that you go back to over and over again, odds are you know what your niches are. It's not that it's not figuring out the niche. Although many agencies pick way too broad of a niche, right? Like again, healthcare, that is not a niche. So it's not about picking the niche. It's about two things. One, it's about narrowing down. It's about really drilling down deep enough that you can be unique in that space. There are a million healthcare agents. Every agency on the planet probably has a hospital on their roster and could claim to be a healthcare agency, right? So you have to yeah. drill down deeper than that. But the other thing you have to do is you have to actually have the courage to call it out. So you being the subject matter expert for companies who sell pharma products to women over 50 does you no good if that's a secret that you keep and you only talk about it in biz dev pitches with those kind of clients, but it's not on your website. It's not the focus of your content. It is not in your LinkedIn bios. It's not in all of the places where you should be shouting that story. So it really is a combination of, of really narrowing down far enough, which takes courage. And then it's about shouting it from the mountaintop, which takes even more courage. Because as an agency owner, what we think is the minute I tell everyone that we are the agency for pharma products for women over 50, no one else is going to hire us. And quite honestly, that's just not true. Mm -hmm. And even right. if it is true, there are enough businesses out there that do sell to that target audience that you'll be fine. We don't need, as agencies, we don't need 50 new clients a year. We should also only be targeting clients that are 10% or more of our AGI. Don't waste your time going after the minnows. Go after good-sized fish. Not a whale necessarily, but good-sized fish. You know, you get two clients that are 10% of your AGI. That means your, your agency is growing by 20 or 25% year over year. That's about as much growth as we can sustain and manage, quite honestly. Sure. Yeah. And it, it's interesting, again, it's Cobbler's Kids because agencies are telling their clients over and over, you need to target better. We need to improve your <laughs> messaging. You know, right. so it's interesting. So, I, you know, I'm just going to I'm going to jump to a, one of the questions that has come in and it came in from Shane because it's really relevant to what you were just talking about. Yep. Um, and they ask, what are the biggest issues you see with agencies not niching? Um, and is it a mindset issue or a lack of expertise or is there anything else you can add there, Drew? So, uh, first of all, I think, I think I'm going to answer it two ways. One of the disadvantages of not niching of being a generalist is you really are bound by geography. No one's going to drive by five primary care physicians to get to the sixth one, but we will drive hundreds of miles to get to Mayo Clinic over our regular doctor. So one of the challenges if you're a generalist is you are bound by probably a two or three hour drive. So you've really narrowed the field of who you can serve and it makes it very difficult for you to be not only findable, but sought after because your content has to be broad to cover the butcher and the baker and the candlestick maker. I think the reasons why agencies don't do it are number one, biz dev, although it should be the number one job for every agency owner out there, you're so busy running from fire to fire to fire that it's hard for you to stop and think about these big picture things and make the changes and then implement them through your agency. So number one, it's a time issue. Number two, it's a focus issue. Number three, I think it's, I think it is mostly fear-based that, so for example, I've had a lot of agencies say to me, man, I am glad that I wasn't in the travel and tourism industry during COVID and I said, you know what, actually the AMI agencies that specialize in travel and tourism, because they were so specialists as, as those companies were coming back out of their hibernation and starting to spend again, guess who they sought after? The specialists. Those agencies sure. are all back in the black. They're all doing fine. So there is no, and by the way, they were killing it for the nine years between the recession and COVID. So yeah, every once in a while, you're going to have a tough year, but you're going to have that as an agency no matter what. 
Yeah, it, it's I think it rings true to me as well. The agencies that I know that are specialized are seem to be doing okay these days, you know. Yeah. And well, let me transition just just a second here um, to another question, moving away from niche, niches a little bit. So, you know, we, we've got two thousand agency partners that are on the Sharp Spring platform, and you know, we're dedicated to enabling them to market themselves better, but also help them help their clients sure. better. You know, so I'm just kind of curious, what's your take on, you know, what services should the agencies be thinking about that maybe they're not offering these days? You know, yeah. it could be, you know, obviously 2020 is a unique year, but, uh, you know, pre or post COVID, you know, what is what should this look like? Yeah, our research shows that what clients want is and we talk about it a lot, but I don't know that we do it very well yet as a group. Uh, they want an agency to be able to help them harvest the data that they have and use that data to make better and more proactive decisions. And so certainly tools like SharpSpring and other AI tools and things like that give us a wealth of data that we, so clients have the data, they just have no idea what it means. So they need an interpreter. And that's what an agency really can do well is to look at the data and be able to say, you know what, based on what we're seeing, we should be heading in this direction or we should be talking more about this. The other thing that is really interesting is clients are asking agencies to help them with brand. They're asking them to help them decide how to deal with or if they should deal with social issues. Right now, there's a lot of pressure on all companies out there to have a, to take a stand on some of the social issues that we're facing in the world today. And they don't know how to do that effectively and well. And so they don't have a lot of courage around it. So part of what an agency does for their clients is give them courage to get out there and express their opinion, if that makes sense. But a lot of it is around harnessing the insights that technology gives us that our clients don't know how to do. Sure. You know, what, one of the things that, you know, we're talking about today, the, in your, most of your talk was about really business development, kind of build, yeah. building on, on that. And I know that you are, you know, also think about and speak about, you know, client retention and customer sure. communication and things like that. So, I mean, do you think agencies by and large are putting enough effort into retaining yeah. their customers and the customer communication and yeah. what, you know, what are the steps to just do better and why should they do better? Yeah. So again, what our research shows is that clients, one of the main reasons why a client leaves an agency is because they sort of feel like they are taken advantage of it. And what they say to us literally is, you know what, the agency used to bring me flowers on a Tuesday because they wanted my business so badly. And now I don't even get flowers on our anniversary anymore. Like I don't feel important to them. And certainly one of the ways you can make them feel important is by being an authority. And again, that reinforces their buying decision. But some of the other things that you should be doing as agencies are you should have a program. So when we teach biz dev, one of the categories of business development that we make you write a plan around is your existing clients. Because remember, a lot of your net new income should come from those existing clients. So that's not going to happen if you don't nurture those relationships, if you don't reinforce their buying decision. And so regular communication. And in a lot of cases, one of the techniques that we suggest is what I call the pst email, which is, hey, clients, we're watching this thing over here. We're not talking about it publicly. It's not on our blog or in our podcast, but we want you to know that we're talking about it and sort of giving them some education because one of the things that we've seen is as an agency steps into an authority position, the clients go, man, you're kind of giving away the goods to everybody. So what's in it for me as your client? So you want to hold back some of your data, some of your best teaching. Uh, and we do that, for example, with our research. We we release our research every year, but we hold back some of the data and we only give it to AMI members. So we're re reinforcing that they have a value in being a part of our tribe. So I think we should all be doing that as agencies. Yeah, yeah, I think every, every business now needs to be focusing on customer experience and customer retention. And it's, it, I've heard it said that retention is the new acquisition. So, you know, that's one way to think about it too, if you're right. a small agency. So we've got a lot of questions coming in here, Drew, and I wanna to get to more of them uh, that are coming in from the audience. So great, this kind of goes back to biz, uh, business development but Carla asks, 
how do you sell when clients have decreasing budgets, which is definitely some of them do these days. Right. And do you work to gain more clients with smaller scopes of work or what are your, what are your thoughts for how to approach that? Well, I think it's a couple of things. Number one, yeah, you're right. Right now, clients have a smaller budget, but recognize that this is a moment, not a forever. And so what I would be doing is I would be doubling down on anybody who's in the pipeline that I already have a conversation going with, that I have a relationship with. And if their budget is smaller in the beginning, I know as we come out of COVID and the recession starts to ease up, those dollars are going to come back. I would also, to your point earlier, Chip, I also would really double down with your current clients. They're already giving you money. And so it's easier for them to give you more money than it is for someone to give you the first dollar. And the other thing I want to remind you is when you are perceived as an expert, you will be the first one that gets sought after. So one of the things that I would love for you to be doing during this time is really establishing that position of expertise so that when someone goes looking for an agency with that knowledge, you show up. And so that shortens your sales cycle significantly. And by the way, as I said in the video, you are, you're able to charge a premium because you're not a generalist. Sure. You know, and there's kind of a transition to that. I mean, number one, recognizing that you're a teacher, finding the right niche and then sure. leaning into it. Right. And, you know, so there's some, some time that that takes to, to kind of mature, so to speak. And, and uh, Scott uh, asks, so wh uh, while you are building your authority and you're teaching, right, you're kind of bringing yeah. that into your practice, you know, it takes time. Yeah. Um, and clients maybe not, you know, if you're a newer agency, especially, you might be waiting for your clients to come. You don't have any clients yet. So how do you prospect for new business when organizations and decision makers don't know you? Yeah, so I, I think you prospect for those. So one of the core tenets of this idea of being an authority is when we traditionally as agency owners, when we are prospecting for business, we are demonstrating to that prospect that we're interested. In other words, we are interested in their business. And I think we have to flip that around and we have to be interesting. So rather than, you know, it's sort of the akin of walking into a bar, walking up to somebody and saying, hi, it's really nice to meet you. My name is Drew. Would you like to get married? Which by the way, doesn't work. Um, right. right? Yeah. So yeah. I think it's the same thing. It's really about yeah. sitting down and having an interesting conversation that the other person finds value in. And then over time, the conversation gets more and more intimate and leads to an actual relationship. So in terms of biz dev, so that's, that's sort of the one side of it. But the other side is when you've decided, when you've defined your niche, it's pretty easy to put together a target list of people who are going to care about your expertise. So you actually already have the expertise. The world may not know it yet. You may not have written your book yet. You may not have launched your podcast whatever it is, but you already know your stuff. You're good at what you do. And if you've narrowed down to a niche, whatever that is, you picked it because you have experience, you have case studies, and you know more than the average bear about that. So I would start talking to them about that. Hey, we use a checklist for our clients that they should use before they appear on a new show. Would you be interested in seeing that? Because I know that you have been on a lot of newscasts lately. I, hey, we have a tool that we share with our clients that helps them write a blog post in half of the time. I would love to send that to you. So I'm being interesting, right? I'm helping them do their job better. One of the, one of the things that needs to repeat in your brain over and over and over again is, how am I helping this person do their job better today? Which has nothing to do with them hiring me. It's just, I am being helpful. I am being interesting and of course, they're going to go, I'm sorry, and what do you do again? And how do you do that? And sooner or later, you're going to get into a conversation where you can talk to them about doing work for them, but don't rush at them because none of us like that. I mean, think about when you go into a retail store, what is the one thing you don't want to have happen, right? You don't want to have four salespeople converging upon you, all asking if they can help you. Same thing. They don't like it any more than we do. Right. You know, um, it, it, it kind of leads in well to another question that just came in. You know, we, uh, Kyle said, you know, when you've been feeding the deer, you know, how do you pivot? How do you make that pivot to getting paid? So I don't know if there's 
any more you want to add to that at all, Drew? Yeah, you know, when when you have created an audience, right, and you have been helpful over and over and over again, you are able to work in into the conversation how you help other people. You might have the opportunity to do case studies. You know, in between my video presentation and what we've been doing so far, I've talked, I've mentioned that we have peer groups. I've mentioned that we have workshops. I've mentioned several things we do, right? So if you're an agency that is looking for someone like AMI and you're like, oh, this Drew guy seems like he kind of knows what he's talking about, you're going to seek those things out. And that's, I think, the hardest part is that we don't have to be the driver. Here's the reality for us, and this is a harsh reality. There is nothing we can do as agencies to make a client buy something before they want to buy it. There's no buy one, get one free coupon. There's no white sale. There's no, we have nothing that we can do that's going to make someone go, you know what? I didn't really need an SEO program, but I'm going to buy one today. So all we can do is be present so that on the day they decide to buy something, we're the one of the two or three agencies that comes to mind that they want to talk to. And when you do it really well, when you really establish this position of authority, you're the only one they think of. And so they just call you and say, hey, I finally have a project. You know, I've been following you for years. I've been on your newsletter list. However you have been sharing, um, that's how that works. But you absolutely should have a targeted list. But what you do with that targeted list is you go out of your way to be even more helpful and a better teacher and be more interesting by sharing with them things that they can really use right now in their job. And then you engage them in conversation about what you do and who you do it for. And you lean into case studies and things like that. And you certainly can say things like, when you're ready to hire an agency, or if you have a project that you think we could be helpful in, we would love to talk to you about that. But anything yeah. more than that feels aggressive and people think it's yucky. Yeah. And so, so if you've done your work and you're, you're positioning yourself well, you're messaging yourself well, yeah. you're targeting the right people, more, more word of mouth is going to happen. You're going to find more of the right clients over time. I, that was the super interesting data from uh, your presentation, just how many agencies are just being found. Right. You know, you, and, you know, and during COVID, five of my agencies inside the AMI world, five of them who are specialists in something, landed the largest client in their agency's history. And not one of them knew about that prospect until the prospect called or emailed them. Biggest client in their agency's history during COVID. And it wow. was an unsolicited thing. Why? Because they've been helpful over and over and they were sought after because of their expertise. For sure. Yeah. There's, um, I, I'm just looking at the time here, Drew, and I want to make sure that we get to a few more questions. Sure. And I do want to get to the question that we have for next week's guest, which is Chris Brogan, who's joining the Agency Acceleration Series on 10-7. And so um, if you've been following along, by the way, throughout this series, you know they're always having the, the next guest pose a question to the, to the current guest. And so I'll tell you about, more about Chris in a, uh, a second, but Chris asks, you know, everyone is so attention overwhelmed right now. Uh, they're drowning in correspondence, the news, there's worries and uncertainty, and it's kind of hard to focus on anything, let alone pitching and selling. Right. So what roles do brevity and clarity have in agencies delivering a useful message that might spark the attention of potential clients? Yeah. So again, I know we're running out of time. So guys, my email is in the chat. If I didn't answer your question, shoot me it by email and I'll answer it. So to Chris's question, I don't think it's about brevity. I do think it's about clarity. I don't think it's about brevity. I think we are we are starting to be very careful about what we consume because there's so much out there right now. Everybody, because we are all stuck behind our computer screens, everyone is producing content, pushing it out. And there's so much. You could literally watch a webinar an hour for 24 hours a day. But for example, everybody who's here today, they're here today because this content is clearly for them. 
And so the way you break through the clutter is by being very clear about what you're going to teach and how the recipient can use it in their daily life, in their job, to make their job better. In our cases, to keep their job by making up for all the lost sales during COVID, whatever that may be. So the clarity that you are offering something that they can put into action right now and that it's going to have impact and make a difference, that to me is how you break through the clutter. And if you do that well, the, the brevity doesn't matter because they're going to be so hungry for something that actually is valuable that they will consume long form content or read your book or listen to your podcast, even though it's a whole hour, they will consume it because it's meaningful to them. So that's the trick. It, before you push out anything, whether you're sending an email to a prospect or you're pushing out something to your entire mailing list, ask yourself, is this helpful? Am I teaching something useful? And is my recipient going to go, wow, I'm going to put away something else to look at this because I know there's meat on that bone. If you can do that, you're golden. You know, agencies should be great at this, right? I mean, on behalf of clients, we're tightening messaging all the time. And, you know, maybe I'll just take one more message kind of because it kind of builds on that. Or one more question. And, sure. and then, then we'll talk about what's what's next. So Tom asked uh, the question because a lot of agencies, they're doing pitching all the time and they're having capabilities meetings yeah. um, with new and existing customers, right? So what's the most important thing that you've seen, Drew, or the biggest failure, maybe that's that would be maybe as helpful in a capabilities meeting for an agency. Yeah, the mistake we, so you're right, we're great at this for clients, but there's no skin in the game, right? Like for us, it's an intellectual exercise. Not that we don't love our clients and care about our clients, but it's different. When it's us, we're thinking, I got to make payroll. And I want to give my people raises or I don't want to have to lay people off. So the the pressure to sell and to sell quickly is very different when it's our own stuff, which is why we make all the mistakes that we make, because we allow that pressure to get us to do things that we would never do for a client. And the capabilities pitch is the perfect example. The biggest mistake I see, and I see it in large agencies, small agencies, is we talk about ourselves through most of the capabilities. Yes, they're asking for your capabilities, but they really don't care about you. So you need to frame your capabilities in relation to them and how you can help them. And case studies that, again, even in your capabilities presentation, you should be teaching them things that they could employ whether they hire you or not. So in a 30-minute capabilities or a 60-minute capabilities, the about the agency part that where you're really talking about yourself should be about 10%. That's it. And then the rest of it is in relation to them, how can you be helpful? And that's the biggest mistake I see in, pres in capabilities presentations, that if they've asked you for a capabilities presentation, they've already decided you're able to do the job. This is a chemistry check, and they just want to hear how you present, see how they connect with you. So the more you talk about them, the more interesting they're going to think you are. Just like at any cocktail party, the people who ask us the most questions about us are the most fascinating conversationalists we've ever met. We have to employ that in our capabilities presentation. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think a lot of agency owners are pretty naturally good at this if they can get out of their own way, right? So right. just uh, ask questions that they, they kind of naturally are, are great at that if they lean into that. Yep. So, so Drew, any final thoughts uh, before we go? I know that you want people to go ahead and email you and uh, you know if they have further questions for you. Sure. It yeah. has been phenomenal to, ha to have you. And I, I think the content was, was right on point and uh, excited to potentially do some stuff in the future. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And again, happy to answer any questions. And I'm also easy to find on social channels. If you want to connect with me there, I would be happy to be uh, there with you connecting and as you might imagine, I eat my own dog food. And so I'm constantly sharing things that I hope are helpful to agency owners. So happy to happy to be there with you as well. Well, you, you clearly, you. yeah, yeah. Thank you, Drew. And, and you, you clearly did share some really valuable stuff. And we intend to as well for the next several weeks as we're continuing our agency acceleration series 
And again, next week, October 7th, can't believe it's October, we've got Chris Brogan coming up, who's the CEO of uh, Owner Media Group and president of Chris Brogan Media. So that's October 7th, 12 Eastern time. You know, it's going to be a very similar format, and I'm going to be uh, taking questions uh, or answering uh, questions. Chris is going to be answering questions that I ask him. There, there we go. I got through that. Um, and then uh, the next several sessions coming up uh, are also really great. So I think a lot of you have heard about Rand Fishkin, definitely. He's sort of a luminary in the SEO field. Um, and, you know, he's going to be talking a bit about SEO, but also influencer marketing and how agencies can build on that. Uh, Jason Swink, many of you know, is another author talking about growing and scaling your agency. And then we have Ann Smarty again, who's just a, an incredible talent in digital marketing and SEO. And she's going to be talking specifically about SEO for agencies. And you got to love a name like Smarty. So I'm, 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 I'm hoping she, that session is going to be amazing. Um, for a reminder, for those of you that uh, joined us uh, a little bit late. So thank you for joining today. You can get a signed copy of Drew's book uh, if you get a demo of SharpSpring and we're gonna share the link in the chat if you wanna do that. And it seems like great content. It may be life-changing. I'd encourage you to go out and buy it or get a demo of SharpSpring and get a signed version of it. Um, and one more slide that I have for you today. Thank you as an audience for coming today. Uh, assuming you're an agency uh, owner or you're an, uh, participating in an agency, hopefully this content was on point for the types of things you're thinking about and struggling with. We'd love to get your feedback. We'd love to hear what you think. Uh, so you can use that link right there or the QR code and go ahead and uh, take the survey. So we have eight more sessions yet this year of the Agency Acceleration Series, and please do register sharpspring.com slash acceleration if you haven't. And I'm gonna thank Drew one more time. Great session, Drew, and uh, hopefully I'll get to talk to you again in the future. Sounds good, thank you. Thanks everybody for coming.